Well, we are finishing the Sun'a manuscript, and guess what? You're gonna find the conclusions we come to in the Sun'a manuscript do not fit the standard Islamic nar uh, narrative at all. And this is why it's important that you follow the latest research. You wanna see what that is? Come with us, we'll show you. Greetings, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I welcome you back to a continuation of our series on creating the Quran. Last time, we uh, took a deep dive into the lower layer of the Sana manuscript, and right now we are going to take a look also at the upper layer of the Sana manuscript and explore some of the problems that are found in there when we compare it to the 1924 Cairo edition. With me here in studios to unpack all of that for us is our dear Dr. J. Smith. Dr. J., Welcome back. Yeah, good to have me back and also to continue with this uh, very interesting Sana manuscript problem because obviously it is a difficulty since it's been since it was discovered back in 1975. And so far, the Muslims haven't really dealt with it. It's been Europeans who have been dealing with it. And it's the European scholars like Elizabeth and Gerard Puin, they have probably done more work on it than any other. We, uh, Asma Hilali is for the first one that's tried to respond with it, uh, it from within the Islamic tradition, did not do a very good job. And some people believe she, she wrote this way too early. She should not have been the one to write it because she was not the one who really did the work on it, like the Quins, even Sadegin and, uh, and uh, Bergman have with, a, with the, what they did on the radiocarbon, they are uh, further ahead than her. But notice that, that both Sadegi and also Bergman came back to a conclusion that the paleographical evidence is better than the radiocarbon evidence. Right. And I want to just say something about her book. Uh, just I'm a little bit biased, uh, the fact that she's an Arab and she's from North Africa. And I spoke with her in the past. And, and in my humble view, uh, her book is an excellent resource for my research, to say the least. Yeah. It's just the conclusions right. are not necessary. That uh, no, Very few of the scholars are going with her conclusions because she's trying to in, she's trying to push it. She's trying to force it within the Islamic traditions, which is knee-jerk reaction that many people have. Now let's go, and l that was the lower layer that we're talking about. Now we're in the upper layer. So this is, uh, she, scholars used to say this is dated to 705, but as you see, almost all the scholars that we quote, and that's why we're quoting scholars, because they're the ones who have done the work on it. They're making, they're saying that the upper layer is mid eighth century. So we're talking about, about the time that, uh, that the Abbasids come to power. We're no longer talking about, mm -hmm. uh, we're no longer talking about Abdul Malik and Hajjaj. Right. I want to say something about this, uh, uh, you know, uh, tension about the dating or the difference in dating between the lower layer and upper layer. Those who would like to say that, oh, the difference was just less than 50 years, you know, there is a problem with this. That tells me that when the lower layer was written, people quickly discovered that it did not represent the Quran. So it still has a problem, whether it was within 50 years or later. Well, you're going to see. I'm going to answer this problem. Yeah. This lower layer is symptomatic of other codices. And this is where Schumacher really comes in. He comes into his, uh, I, I like what he's done. He said, there were other codices. Listen, this Quran had to come from somewhere. Where do you think that it came from? true. Who and I am 100% on board with that. Exactly. It doesn't just come ex nihilo. Exactly. It has to have been borrowed from other sources. That is correct. Those sources would have existed in the seventh century looks like this lower area represents one of those codices which have now long since been destroyed. Remember, that's what the Abbasids did, right? We know this. Look and see what even Al-Buhari even mentions, that uh, he, when he was given 600,000 of these akhbar, these sayings, that's right. Somebody, just the hadith, yeah. he then whittled them down to 7,397. That's 90, 98% of them were thrown away. I mean, Jay, someone didn't just sleep and wake up thinking that there is a Quran and they wrote the lower layer, they had to have memorized it or saw something and wrote it based on that. Yeah, well, I would suggest it reflects other codices. And we're going to get to that. Schumacher is going to talk about I that. I am 100% on. on board. In fact, I did a presentation one time to support this view. Okay, so we're at the upper layer. Let's just uh, go back to our slides again. I want to show you this slide here. And here is from Asma Hilali's book. This is not her, uh, this is not her slide. This is my slides that we put together to show a comparison back and forth. Hatun Tash is actually the one that actually created this one. Uh, and she's, was, uh, she's part of our team that works with us there in London. And if you just take a look at chapter six, verse 63, in the upper text, uh, uh, 
Anjana, uh, you rescued me. If you look at the Kyrene text, it's Anjana, which means he rescued. So that's just a change of uh, the change from you to he. So second person to third person. Coming down to 1676, you direct him comes he directs. So this is again, these are just different uh, changes in who is the one that is doing this. He sends or we send. You make firm, he makes firm. We gather, you gather, they follow. But it, theologically, it could have a problem when you put it in context. Understood, but what are we showing here? And this is what people need to realize. Almost every one of these, which does a difference of person, have to do with diacritical markings. This has nothing to do with consonantal text differences. Whereas what we were looking at earlier with the lower uh, the lower text, that is consonantal. That is a lot more damaging. The consonantal text is much more damaging because that is a complete, those are completely different words, different phrases, as we saw when we looked and did a comparison. In this case, I would I, I, I realize that this is when the diacritical marks were coming in. This is when they're starting to, they're not canonized at this point. So you put your marks where you want to, I put my dots where I want to, and uh, you call yours the al Fadi Quran, I call mine the Joseph Quran or the J Quran, and uh, we now come up with two different Qurans right there mm -hmm. because the dottings are different, and it just changes you to him, he, today. That's true. If you, uh, if you can almost, in every case, uh, so it will feminine or so it will masculine. They see versus you see. She does, he does. It feminine or is it it masculine? You can unpack that and say, yes, that this does change the theology. We're not going to do that right now. We don't have the time. I just want people to get to know and realize that even the upper layer, there is not any standardization at this point. And we're talking about mid-8th century. There's still no standardization. And this is not the full Quran. There's this, this is a, a just piecemeal part of the Quran, all right? So let's see what the conclusions are and let's see what the scholars are saying. In every case, I'm using scholars here. I wanted to see what their conclusions are. Uh, before I get to Shoemaker, though, let's just see. He said that the very, uh, in, on page 76 and 77, the presence of surah titles and decorative features between the surahs indicate a later date in the seventh or the early eighth century. So that's what he's talking about, the lower layer. But Sadegi and Bergman identified short vowels uh, marks in the text, which if accurate, as Doroshi notes, would further indicate a later dating of this Quranic text. So he's now saying, hold on a minute, let's be careful. Let the scholars say that. So Shoemaker is showing you that there are, there are two ways to look at it. Yeah. Let me comment on this, you know, I, and I respect Shoemaker. I have also uh, uh, an issue when we make a claim that the surah titles are a later thing. We have evidence that surah titles have been mentioned later, but the decorative features, I agree. Okay, okay. good work to come back on that. Now, Salad, um, Eleanor Salad that we talked about before, looking at the Dam 0129, not 27, but 29 right. one, concludes uh, that its dating is early 8th century, seems to be indicated by the Tepalim says. Franz de Roche, says that the upper text of the Quran is from the mid 8th century. So he's not, you can see there. And she's his student, by the way. And there's not an agreement between those two. So around 750, we're talking about the time when the Abbasids come to power. So let's see what Shoemaker then concludes. And he says, the original Quranic text of the Sana manuscript erased lower writing is a non-standard version of the Quran that deviates regularly from the received version, now identified as the Uthmanic Quran. So far, efforts to identify the manuscript's original Quran has not been successful. What we have in the under text of the Sana, this is uh, 01, 27, not the 29, 27, is a witness to a different early version of the Quran. And that's what the Palm says, is it's in this 27. So fascinating, you're getting even a dis disagreement within scholarship, yet it's very clear that this is not Uthmanic. These are all either from the time of Abd al-Malik or from the time of the Abbasid incursion when they then take over. And they, of course, they take the, uh, they are the ones who then what we would suggest are the ones that solidified and canonic, canonized the Quran. When is that canonical text? Million dollar question. I would suggest it's around the 10th century. Uh, possibly the Kuwaiti Quran would probably be the one that most scholars are looking at today. But that's 300 years later. Yeah, the Kuwaiti Quran is a later one, and I myself inspected uh, at least uh, uh, some aspects of it and uh, did some uh, research on that, and it is a later time. It's in uh, 13th century. You know, we're not talking about something that was uh, immediately after the fact. What are we going to talk about next? Well, I want to get back to that reference that Van Putin referred to. And he, ref he went to the, tu uh, the Tubigen manuscript, which is in Germany. Let's look at the Tubigen next. And let's ask the same question that we've asked in the Sana, looking at the carbon dating. Let's ask what we now know about the Tubigen Quran. It's important that we run both down. 
So let's go yeah. to the tube again. And Just out of curiosity, did uh, are you aware of any effort by uh, Van Putin to come back and maybe either clarify his position or correct his position or modify his position based on any new discoveries? No, this is what's interesting. That's why I'm wondering if he's even in this discussion anymore. I would love to see how he's gonna he's gonna support what Shoemaker because what Shoemaker does, as we said at the very beginning, he only takes the scholars' quotations. He says, "Let's follow where the scholarship is right now." Now this was. This was uh, published in 2022, August of 2022. So it's very, very recent. Van Putin has been saying this for years. I'd love to see what he's going to do on his comeback on this. Wonderful. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, everyone. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.